Welcome to episode four of Full House Rewind, also known as The Return of Grandma. I'm your host, Dave Coulier. Adam Carolla is our guest on the show today, and he'll be joining us shortly. Today, we're going to be talking about episode number four, also known as The Return of Grandma. Now, this is the first time Joey does Yosemite Sam and Elmer Fudd impressions on the show. And Jesse brings home a turtle named Bubba that apparently saved his life the night before. And of course, Grandma Tanner shows up, and then Joey and Jesse's moms show up as well. Joey and his mom do an impression of a vacuum cleaner. The girls lose Bubba the turtle, and then the guys clean the house to James Brown's I Feel Good. Episode four of Full House wraps up with Bubba the Turtle reappearing in the kitchen on a skateboard. We'd like to hear what you think about episode four, so send us an email at fullhouserewind at podco.us. You've got messages. Oh, time to check the messages. Eh, what's up, Doc? It's me, Bugs. I heard you mention my name on your Full House Rewind show. Ooh. Did I just hear that, a rabbit? Be very, very quiet. It's wabbit hunting season. (laughs) Eh, that's nothing to stew about, Doc. Get it? Stew? When I catch that rabbit, first, I'm gonna... Oh, somebody's here. Hi, Dave. Hey, Comet, what's going on? Did I just hear a rabbit? Yeah, that was Bugs Bunny. A bunny? Yeah, a a bunny. Where? (laughs) No, he was just on the answering machine. Oh, I thought maybe he wandered into the backyard. Okay, I'm probably going to stop by every day. Love you, Dave. (laughs) I love you too, Comet. And you're going to love our special guest on the show today. Once in a while throughout my showbiz career, I've gotten to meet someone who is pretty damn great. Not just because they're super successful or talented, but because they're just a good, solid person. I first heard Adam Carolla on Loveline, which was a great radio program. I first saw Adam as a co-host with Jimmy Kimmel on The Man Show, and I thought, this guy's pretty damn funny. I first met Adam when I was a guest on his radio show. We discovered that we both like airplanes and, well, we both like to build things. After I did his show, he invited me over to his house to show me some of the woodwork he did in his home. His podcast, The Adam Carolla Show, is the number one daily downloaded podcast in the world. Here's a pic of Adam when Full House was on the air. Please welcome to Full House Rewind, Adam Carolla. Adam, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Um, Usually I'm on the other side of the mic. I'm usually on on your show, talking to you, and you're firing questions at me. I got to ask you this. Because your show, the Adam Carolla Show, uh, is is so successful, what do you think is the, you know, the secret ingredients behind a successful podcast? You know, I think consistency. I think just early and often, uh, for me, I went five days a week from Jump Street, um, should be a podcast about 21 Jump Street. All right, that's <laughs> yeah. mine. Hey, there's an idea. There's that's an his. idea. Let's, that's all yours. Let's, let's monkey with the format a that's little That's all here. yours. That we'll a pretty sign. popular show. <laughs> uh, I, I went five days a week when there was no model, there was no pay, there was no revenue, there was, yeah. no, there was nothing, you know, almost 15 years ago. So I, for, for me, I think, Success in podcasting is no different than success in any field, which is yeah. just do it, do it all the time. Hopefully, if you have something to say or some ability, eventually you'll find some traction. Now, did you bring a lot of your fans from radio and, and previous shows that you'd done? Did you find that they followed you right to the podcast? Was it easy to find you? Because, I mean, you were kind of a pioneer in the podcast world, really. Well, my... So I think what happened was, is I was on a program called Loveline, which oh, yeah, is a syndicated radio show, yeah. and it was very popular, and it was in 150 markets or it something. It was show. all over the, the United States. And then I left Loveline, and I went to do mornings to take over for Howard Stern on the West Coast. And then I went from 150 
syndicators to or affiliates to 10, you know, Seattle and Vegas and, yeah. you know, Tacoma, yeah. and whatever. And so then there were all these like orphaned people who are like, oh, we used to listen to this guy and now he's not in our market anymore. And so sort of unbeknownst to me because no one really knew what was going on. They were going online and streaming my morning show on their computer because we were in Chicago. Loveline was in Chicago for a decade. It was a big hit. All of a sudden, I'm not in Chicago anymore. Right. So certain amount of fans went to their computer and just sort of streamed it. It wasn't really podcasting right. back in like 07. Yeah. So it was just a feed and you're sending it out and people could hit a link and yeah. listen to the show, right? Yeah, and 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 they would say when we we're talking about ratings every quarter or whatever, they'd go, oh, you're doing great in Vegas and doing great in Seattle and you're not doing great in LA and we need to whatever. And then they'd go, oh, and you had 5 million minutes of streaming last last month. And I'd go, yeah. oh, that's good, right? And yeah. they'd go, no, who cares? <laughs> and I'd go, yeah, but there's like, and they'd say second only to the fan in New York that carried the Yankees or right. something. And they yeah. go, they would literally say you'd have like 19 million minutes of streaming. And I'd go, well, that's got to count for something. And they go, it doesn't count for anything. We can't sell it. We're not interested. But it kind of stuck in my head. Like all those people yeah. streaming the show should be something. And a, a few years later when they flip format and I was out of a job, it, it stuck in my head that we should just, Take this to the internet. Well, yeah, which was smart because there was, but back then there was no subscription model. There were probably no sponsors. It was just kind of, I mean, it was you were, it was kind of a foray into where's this going, right? Like you didn't know back then, but now, I mean, yeah, I mean, the 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 thing about I guess life is people get used to a model, and then that's the model. And they, yeah. they don't have much imagination, you know. They go, you know, you would say to art, Ex except for you folks. Oh yeah, right? people are uh, really you're tons of imagination. Oh, you're like yeah. Dr. Seuss, <laughs> this audience. But if you said to our dads, someday people are going to pay six dollars for a bottle of water, they'd go get the hell out of here. You drink from the hose it's and free. take the garbage out and take the garbage out. Yeah, throw it in the ash can. <laughs> yeah, it, water's free. Why would anyone? Yeah. You know, and so like when we were getting millions of minutes of streaming, I was going, well, that that feels like an audience. Yeah, yeah. And everyone's like, eh, it's not, nobody monetizes that. Like there's no way. And and I was like, but let's not be so dismissive. I mean, if you have these millions of minutes and people listening, well, then what? what's, sell them a can of Coke, you know? Yeah. And they're like, ah, it doesn't. But it was only because it didn't, it didn't happen before that. Yeah. Well, and on, Full House, we had millions of people watching. You don't seem to be the type of guy who probably sat and watched all 192 episodes of Full House. But well, not in one sitting. Because <laughs> that's but, put a pot of coffee but, on. Yeah. But I probably have seen the lion's share of Full House episodes. But you got kids. Right. So, I mean, was it ever on? Did your kids ever watch it? You were talking about your daughter, and she's a teenager. Right. Um, that's kind of right in the full house wheelhouse in syndication, you know? Yeah, I think what I've noticed my kids doing is discovering shows like Friends, discovering shows yeah. like The Office, discovering shows that were part of our life, you know, at an earlier age, and, and sort of seeing them for the first time and, you know, almost like the first time I saw Gone with the Wind you know, made in 1929 or, or the wizard of Oz. And yeah. I was like, Oh, you know, I saw it for the first time in 1975 or something. I was like, Oh, it's a fine brand new film, you know, for yeah. me. So I think, uh, her and, and, and their group, I think they discovered full house, you know, obviously at a, at, at, at in syndication. It's like stuff goes out of vogue and then it becomes cool. And then it goes out of style again. And then it comes, back in style it's like clothing you know like tv shows yeah you know do the same thing you know they kind of ebb and flow and they're popular again and but i i i watch i think i watched a, f a fair number of episodes yeah. but i but i wouldn't know you if it wasn't for full house i probably 
because we never ran into each other at comedy clubs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I was, because back in the day, I remember you were either, for a while, you were either a comedy store guy or you were an improv guy, you know, and mostly I was at the comedy store. When you were working out your stuff, were you at Laugh Factory or the store or any so, of those places? I mean, not not exactly. What What I did was, Early in my, I wouldn't even call it a career because I didn't have a career, but early for me, I just started showing up at open mics sort of wherever. It didn't here, matter. here locally in LA, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and it could have been the comedy store, it could have been the improv, it could have been the deli smoker on Ventura Boulevard. Osco's like, Disco, remember that place? Yeah, any, any place <laughs> yeah. that had an open mic. Yeah. I, I would show up and, and it became kind of apparent at least to me and probably most of the audience that a standup really wasn't my sport, you know, yeah, yeah. I was like a good athlete, but I, but you still need to find your sport, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I think comedy is yeah. kind of that way. And if, yeah. if Michael Jordan just played baseball, he'd probably be an okay baseball player, but he wouldn't be the goat, right. you know? And right. so I ended up drifting into the groundlings and the, later on, Form the uh, Acme Comedy Improv Troupe, and and I. Oh, you st- st- you started Acme? Yeah, or oh, one, you were of, one of the first. I was there people? the first day. Oh, along cool. With six other people. Yeah, you know, and um, so and I built the theater, the one that was in NoHo at least before they moved to the West Side. But I I was like doing improv, um, doing a lot of group sketch and improv, and like a little bit of right. stand up. Right. But I was kind of trying to find my sport. Right. And I, I wanted to do radio. I was interested in radio. I didn't know how to do radio. I didn't know anybody in radio. So I was just kind of knocking around right. doing comedy. Like, but it wasn't <laughs> this comedy or that comedy. Sure. And I was kind of like, eh, you don't really seem like your sitcom material. You know, you're not a writer. I couldn't read or write very well. Um, and I, I really couldn't find a home. And so I just sort of trained for a long time. So you grew up here in Southern California. Um, yes. Who were the radio guys you listened to back then when you were growing up? Like, who did you really gravitate? You thought they had a really interesting show. Who were the guys back then? There was uh, Frazier Smith. Oh, Frazier. Yeah, I there, know Frazier. I used to I used to do funny characters on his show. Was he at KLOS? Yeah, he was out of Detroit well, right? back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was Mark and Brian on KLS. Yeah, right. uh, later on, there was Kevin and Bean on K Rock. Right. Uh, Rick D's, uh, the Baker Boys. I think were on. I, I I listened to everything. There was good radio. There was yeah. good. There was good stuff. And then some of the AM guys. Was it Phil Hendry? Phil Hendry. Phil Hendry was funny. Super funny. He was really funny. I used to love listening to him, and I always wanted to meet that guy. And I never because he did characters, you know. And I always thought, wow, this guy's really, he's really great. It's a really dry, funny program. And, and, and yeah. he was great. Uh, over the years, did you ever run into Saget like at that level of the club level? Or did, was he ever on your show? I mean, I, I uh, you know, uh, everyone at some point cycled through Loveline sure. when it was on MTV and when it was on K Rock out here. So I'm, I'm sure. Saget cycled through at I'm some sure. point. Yeah, I, I didn't I, get to know him well until a little bit later when he asked me to do the scleroderma charity, and, right. some, and I would do the charity, and yeah. and then he'd come on the podcast, and we'd get to spend a little more time together. Stamos, you ever run into John? Did you ever? Uh... I don't know if I are we allowed to call him Blackie or you can call uh, him Blackie yeah on this show you can call him Blackie because we reference General Hospital it's uh, it's cool it's all good yeah I don't first off I I hate saying I don't think I've ever interviewed that guy because then they would tell you I interviewed them (laughs) three times because I we just cycled through so many thousands of people and I have lowish self-esteem so I was like (laughs) I don't think I know that guy and then someone would go you've definitely interviewed that guy like a few times but i don't have i don't have a strong stamos memory isn't it funny how people that are funny have low self-esteem is it is it because you have low self uh, low self-esteem that 
you know, comedy is kind of a icebreaker. It's kind of a way to kind of disarm people. Because for me, it was. I was very insecure as a kid. I had crooked teeth. I eventually had braces on my teeth. My parents got divorced when I was nine, and it just kind of ripped our family apart. So for me, I was a jock. And, you know, comedy was a way of bonding with guys in the locker room playing hockey or baseball or something, you know? And a lot of comedians, they have some kind of weird tragedy or something happen in their life that causes them to want to be the center of attention for laughter, you know? So for you, where is it? Where do you think your sense of humor is, is driven from? I was funny like people have a musical ear, you right. know, like, oh, this guy just... He, he doesn't read music, but he hears it and he can play it and he yeah. can mimic it, you know, and I couldn't do voices or impersonations like you could. I just had a funny mind. My mind was always on funny. Like, yeah. I don't know, some guys are horny. Some <laughs> guys are hungry. Uh, I was actually all those things actually, but, but I, I was, I was funny. I was just yeah. funny. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what inspired it. Yeah, my family sucked and, you know, I wasn't a good student and, and any of that. Um, but I was just always funny. I liked it. You know, yeah. I found myself listening to Dr. Demento on Sunday oh, night. Loved it. Yeah. You know, I found myself watching the comedians on The Tonight Show when they would do a set. Like, I, I liked comedy. Like, you know, when you have kids, you have like, you know, the one kid that loves steak rare and the other one won't eat seafood and it's like and everyone wants to know where it came from and the answer is who knows yeah it was just it just is so i was funny i but my family never said anything encouraging or write this down or that was a good one like they're really bad on it wait are we brothers wait yeah. a second yeah. okay we i think i had been. the same family well horrible family <laughs> in terms of encouragement yeah you know and the expectation for me was you know get out of high school go get a job you know move out and yeah and i didn't even talk to them about being funny because they, they, they yeah. never laughed they never it, you know like people would say like oh but your parents care you know they probably didn't want you to get into comedy because it's such a low i said they just wanted me to leave they didn't i wasn't going to college i wasn't doing anything they didn't have aspirations for me they they aspired for me to leave right so and i just left and i just worked construction you know, and I mean, as a laborer, I just dug ditches, you know, I yeah, didn't have any skill you, yeah. set or anything. And so I just kind of knocked around and, um, but eventually I was sort of like, well, this is going to be a long, crappy life if you're just <laughs> on a construction site yeah. digging ditches and, you know, so I just started thinking, well, I think, I think I am funny. Like I, I no one told me I was funny, but I, I got it. Like I, I understand it. I understood that I had certain things that I could do. I could I could ride a unicycle. Okay, <laughs> I have a good sense of balance. I, I sort of owned it. You know right, what I mean? Right. I couldn't be a lawyer. I couldn't be a dentist. I can't take tests. I, I couldn't compose uh, legal briefs and stuff like that. But I, I could make people laugh. So I just started kind of trying to focus on that, thinking, well, this would be a, a more interesting more lucrative, better life if I could do something in common. I, I said in your intro, you know, sometimes in this business that we're in, there's plenty of crazy people. But um, once in a while, you get to meet somebody who's just grounded and just solid. And that's that's what I think of you, you know, because um, after I did your show, we started talking off mic and we started talking about building and construction and and, um, you know, I was always really interested in that. You know, I love putting windows in my house. And, and then we started talking about, you know, model airplanes, you know. And I just, I, you know, I, I knew that I was already uh, a fan of you by, you know, Love Line and The Man Show and stuff. And I, and I would say, oh, this guy's funny. I, I think I would like this guy. And sometimes, you know, you meet somebody and you're just so let down. And then when I met you, it was just like, wow, this guy really kind of held up to what I had as this picture in my head, you know? You're just really down to earth. And I think that that, of course, probably just comes from your upbringing and, you know, who you are. But I think, you know, 
me thinking about that, so many people gravitate towards you and what you say on your show. And I think that that, do you think that that being grounded is kind of something that, that all of those people gravitate towards is that, you know, they can really relate to you? I, I think there's a kind of a pragmatism that I have mm. that is you're now finding out that you have to have when you build things. Yeah. You can't just like, in my heart, I believe that glue lamp beam is stronger than that <laughs> paralamp and that we don't need to head out that opening or use a pressure tree to bottom plates. I could keep going. You're talking my language now. I'm building a house. Nailing schedule on shear wall. Oh, yeah. Using OSB, using the struck one half inch. I just put a little uh, 21 AA in the driveway after some one by three, and then uh, we're going to do a uh, tar and chip driveway. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So for for me, I, 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 I was not only grounded by my family, sort of just sort of lackluster, poor, sort of disinterested, you know, environment, <laughs> but... Then for a decade after that, after I left the house, I just was on construction sites getting yelled at by <laughs> Vietnam vets who were strung out on painkillers, right? Yeah, hey, so, hey, what, what, can you just move it? Yeah, it was a lot of, I'll tell you what's a grounding experience when your foreman says, go to my truck and get my four foot level. And you go, oh, okay. And you start walking toward the guy's truck and he goes, run. <laughs> and you have to run as an adult. You're like Gomer Pyle at that point, you know? I'm wearing bags, nails, and screws are like <laughs> flying out of my pouch, you know? I, that's where I grew up. That's where I was. So, yeah. you know, by the time <clears throat> I I did something in show business, the die had already been cast. The, yeah. the cement in the brain was dry. I was just a dude from North Hollywood who worked construction. Do you still build stuff? I, I went over to your house after one of your shows, and you wanted to show me some woodworking You'd done it. It was beautiful stuff. It was great, great stuff. You still keeping uh, a hand in that stuff? Yeah, I, you know, the second I got into show business and, and made any money at all, uh, first thing I did was pay back the IRS. <laughs> the second thing <laughs> I did was bought an old 1923 house that was literally yeah. coming undone. I mean, to say it was a fixer-upper was, I know because uh, Jimmy... Kimmel came to meet me there, like come by for lunch or something one day. And I was halfway into it, you know, and he walked in to this remod I was in the middle of, and he just went, shouldn't you just tear the whole thing down? Like, wouldn't that be easier? And I was like, wow, it's that, that bad, huh? And he's like, well, yeah. cause you saw it. It looked bad and, to him. And you knew. I, yeah. So I had the skill set. I had my old crew and, and stuff the guys i worked with when i was working right you know and i just took it right into now i have money now now we can do this to my house right instead of us all doing it to everyone else's house so were you a rough guy or were you a finished carpenter or both i had this uh kind of unique experience of working rough you know framing foundation forming right. that kind of stuff um, lots of demo, you know, the crap work, you know, you do at the beginning. Um, then getting a job at a cabinet shop and doing cabinets and a lot of laminate, a lot of back in the eighties, everyone was laminate. Sniffing glue. Sniffing oh, glue. Yeah. 3M. <laughs> um, lots of cabinetry, lots of laying up laminate and stuff like that. Yeah. Then I went to a European cabinet shop who, we did custom closets mainly like garage cabinets. It's a Euro metric system, different kind of building than a like traditional. Like Ikea, but early Ikea. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Early Ikea, like, like traditional cabinet shops, you do dados and you do rabbits and you, that's how you do your joinery, you know, make a you yeah. and a thing and a male and a female on the side, whatever. Yeah. And it was a lot of that. This is just pre-finished, um, Vinyl, melamine, Cortron, whatever, rip it up, edge bander, multi-hole driller, Conformat screws, boom, box. I love it when people say to me, do you really know all this crap? I go, <laughs> yeah. you think I can make this? I think you lived you it. Make it up a Conformat screw? Yeah. And then they go, but how do I know this is real? I go, 
ask me to try to bluff my way through t telling you about computers and see how fast you're on to me. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, uh, you know your stuff, that's so for sure. I, and then I did earthquake rehab in the city of Los so Angeles. Oh, like foundations when they came in with all those uh, uh, requirements? Earth and Earthquake rehab would start in the underpinning, pouring footings and pony walls going up yeah. using all thread hold downs and hds and, <laughs> and and shear anchors all those plates you see on the outside of the brick facades all the squares putting those on all thread goes through That's awful work welded to continuous strap which goes all around each floor going to the going to the roof skinning the roof putting parapet braces on and stuff yeah, it, it was crazy hairy dirty yeah it's work. awful so i literally worked at a european cabinet shop and did earthquake rehab those are and did a lot of finish and then ended up kind of specializing in hanging doors did a lot of door hanging yeah so yeah. i did every facet you know drywall crown base case you know whatever so then I would come into my own like house or whatever, and everyone would always be like, "You can you know how to?" I'd go, "I've I've done every part of this right. a thousand times." Right. Yeah. And and you're a car guy. You're big mm -hmm. into cars, right? Yeah. I uh, you know growing up in the Motor City, you know I uh, my favorite car, you know during the muscle car era, like the '60s and '70s, there those Mopar era cars. My favorite was. Uh, 66 corvette i think that's the split window i yeah. think yeah my designed favorite car by pete brock is that who designed it yeah what's Still your favorite alive. what's your favorite car well i would say in the american yeah muscle I, yeah muscle cars yeah. i i would probably have to go with that split window that as well just because it was the most i like european cars i'm sort of a japanese european yeah car guys i like smaller like a little more finesse and that vet you described yeah. is sort of the most euro yeah it's cool versus a you know chevelle or nomad <laughs> or something which is very american you know yeah. sort of big big block you know yeah um ultimately lamborghini mira sv in terms of just like shape design engineering right. and stuff like that but I'd, I'd say in the in the muscle world you know 65 fastback shelby mustang you know 65 66 you know that kind of yeah it's a little smaller little euro i mean i don't know if we're counting cobras in the, the, the shelby's as a, as a muscle the, the car sh yeah the sh uh, yeah but that that kind of stuff i wasn't like el camino dude you know right. just sort of big and full <laughs> of iron and also you know i like independent rears discs you know uh, uh coil over shocks you know, the American stuff was like straight axle, leaf springs, drum brakes, like push rods, iron block, iron heads. Like I was like, this isn't finesse enough right. for me. It's just in Remember your face. the, uh, was it the Plymouth Roadrunner that had the wing on the back? Yeah. Was it a Super B? Didn't they call it a Super B? Yeah, that had a Super B. I don't know if it was a Daytona. I always thought that looked ridiculous. I always it, thought, it well, was. it doesn't really do anything. You're not going to be going 195 miles an hour in that car. Well, they tried to, to like homologate it for Na for NASCAR or something, and it was very dominant. And then they like outlawed it. Yeah, something just like that. Yeah, homologation is a good word. We uh, we saw all of those cars in Detroit. It was a great time to to grow up because I remember they had the Woodward Dream Cruise. And all the way down Woodward, they'd have all these parades of cars, and I would go with my buddies and uh, dream of that '66 Corvette. On your um, on your show, the Adam Carolla Show, you talk a lot about current events, and I think that's you know you seem to be on the pulse of of what's happening. A lot of stuff uh, in the world. Just you, you know, your show's such great free form, and being a guest. You know, on the show, I always find it very interesting to be a guest because you don't ask the typical questions. I never know where you're going to go. I may go in there to promote something, but then we kind of veer off. We just, you know, sometimes it's really immature and we just have a great time. Because you cover so many of those different events, where do you think we're headed with the world of entertainment? And do you think it's getting too watered down now with political correctness like 
Chappelle had his special on Netflix and everybody was up in arms about, you know, the content. But then Netflix said, Hey, you know, we're going to back him and we're going to, we're going to stay behind him. And it is what it is. It's comedy. I mean, do you think it's because there's such cancel culture right now, do you think it's getting watered down or do you think comics that the pendulum's going to swing back and comics are going to have a field day? Well, I, I think everything sort of begats something else. Like you were talking about fashion, you know? Well, right before there was bell bottoms, there was peg leg jeans. You know, yeah. when you take a look in trousers, you take a look at <laughs> yeah. anyone from the 60s, yeah. you know, boom, straight. And then we went to a bell bottom. Yeah. Now, a bell bottom serves no purpose. It's just one more thing to get caught in a bike chain, right? Like, or to, or to step, or to track, you know, cat piss into the house, you know, at, when you've been walking at night or whatever. A bell bottom is a useless piece of article of clothing or design of clothing. But it came back. But it came back. And it, but it, but also exists because your dad wore the straight peg leg ones and we right. went, I'm doing the opposite. What is the opposite of peg leg? Big flared bottoms, right? Yeah. So as a culture, you know, I always kind of think of it like, you know, we went from musically, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and all these kind of anthems about Vietnam and stuff like that, right into Donna Summers and, <laughs> and, and the village people, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's what yeah. we did. We went enough of this yeah. and we got done with the village people we went right into punk rock. Right. Which is the opposite of Donna Summer and the village people and, and disco. Right? right. And then and, and then punk rock gave way to hair bands, which is the opposite of punk rock, right? <laughs> right. So that's it, you know, as a society, we just So that's the pendulum swing. Yeah, we just go we go the other direction. So it's like they talk about political correctness or cancel culture or whatever, and then that goes on for a while. And then at some point, the comedians are always the ones who are going against everything. Right. At some point, go, what's the opposite of cancel culture? And then they, they do that. Yeah. So that, that we're, we're in the phase right now where we've probably hit our saturation point with cancel culture, and we're now swinging the other direction. We're heading toward the bell bottom. Yeah, and I think I feel that as well. Do you think it's handcuffed you with what you're able to say on your show? I... No. Do you, ever, I, do you ever censor yourself because of that? I think there's certain w words and phrases and things that yeah. we people used to say, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, Indian giver. Right. When I was a kid, people said it right. a lot. Do you right. know what I mean? Yeah. I was accused of that many times as a, <laughs> as a lad. But that and, was... and then the things where you kind of go, well, that doesn't sound very complimentary right. or something, or maybe... Right paddy wagon or something right. you know, which has its origins and right. a, 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 a racial thing so i think there are things where you you kind of evolve yeah. and you kind of go oh yeah that that's not the origins are a little dismissive or insulting or something and you didn't really know what it meant but it's probably not a good idea and i think <laughs> as a as a human and as a comedian as a anything you should try to kind of evolve your thinking. Like, you know, if you would have got hold of any American in the fifties and said gay marriage, you know, they'd go, what? No, yeah. you can't do that. It's right. insane. But you they know? were having a gay old time. They were having a gay old, old time. time. Wilma. <laughs> but I, and I think we'd all like to be the person who goes, yeah, there's this thing that I thought was weird and strange or I was against it or whatever it yeah. is. And now, I'm, I'm for it, and it's different, and I've, I've evolved. Because we've turned into our dads. Right. You eventually turn into your dad, and then you turn and ask someone to pull your finger. Yeah. I wish my dad <laughs> did a little more finger pulling. Yeah, my dad would say, pull my entire arm right now. You're not going to believe what's coming out of me. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and then he would shoot himself across the room in a barca lounger <laughs> from, from the force. So, so, so today, you could produce a show like Full House, no problem because we were socially and politically correct. And one of the first shows that was actually very inclusive. Um, and we talked with a lot of subject matter back then in the late 80s, early 90s. 
um, that wasn't being discussed, especially on a family sitcom, uh, probably couldn't produce a show like The Man Show right now, could you? Well, it's funny. Everyone always says to me, could you do The Man Show today? And I go, I could. <laughs> I'm not sure if Jimmy can. Jimmy. <laughs> he has a career. <laughs> um, I, you know, you, you know, could I, do The Man Show, but you wouldn't be able to do it in is in a mainstream venue on right. a major network, you know, cable network and and that that kind of stuff. I don't yeah. I don't think so. But if someone wanted to sort of do it on their own, they could. I don't know that you would find a home for it. I guess that would be the answer. So and that's really what you're saying. Yeah. I don't Well it's yeah, and it's you know, it's different eras too. Like we grew up in the you know, the era of Pryor and Carlin, um, Don Rickles, you know, um, where if they had an insult in their material, there was a purpose behind it. Richard Pryor's was because he was, you know, it was a cathartic process for him to get rid of the pain that existed in his childhood and in, in his life. George Carlin, you know, social commentary talking about, he would say the things that we were all thinking, just like every comic, we're all thinking it, but the comic will go up and, and, and say it, you know, I, I don't know that there could ever be another Don Rickles. Cause did you ever see a Rickles show? Did you ever go and see him live? No, I he was great. I couldn't see anybody live because <clears throat> I didn't have any money. Ever. <laughs> I wish I would have known you that I went and got, saw him. Me, Saget and Stamos went and saw Rickles in Vegas it, with Brad Gray and John Lovitz. Wow. So we're all sitting in this booth and Don was a, probably about 80 back mm -hmm. then. So of course he puts us in the, the hot booth, you know, where the light's going to come on us and he's going to rip on us. And he ripped all the way through each one of us. Um, but he was still doing his act, you know, like, you know, talking about different races and, and it was such a, it was almost a cartoon. He had become a cartoon of himself, you know, Mm -hmm. but he ripped on each of us, called me Dave Collier. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Collier, uh, I don't know what he does, ladies and gentlemen. When Stamos, very good looking man. Bob Saget, the tallest Jew in the business. Mm -hmm. Brad Gray, you never hired me. And John Lovitz, I don't like you, mm -hmm. you know? And then afterwards we went to dinner with Don and his wife um, and his manager. And we just sat there listening to him and he couldn't have been more kind and and john and bob already knew don pretty well i said you got to come and meet him you got to so he was completely different than his on stage persona but i'm not so sure there could be a lot of the comedians that we grew up with i don't know if they could flourish right now i mean there's some great comics you know you got bill burr you got uh chappelle i don't know i just, i guess i'm just trying to get your barometer on what's happening with with stand-ups and comics and what's going on in the ether out there you know in society are we ever going to have guys like that again who really rip the cover off the ball you know and get down to it you know i i think as a comedian you need to say what you think yeah and and it's your job to take a, a thought that may be offensive uh, and, and, and turn it into something that's funny. And, you know, I always kind of said to people, look, if I, if I can't say what I want to say or what I'm thinking, I'll go back to swing and a hammer. Like that's <laughs> the reason I got yeah. into comedy was to, to say what I wanted to say and share opinions, whether they're popular or, or not. And, you know, I think comedy probably like the heavyweight boxing division, you know, they, there's some salad days with Frazier and Ali and Ken Norton and all these, these guys of the seventies. And then there's this drop off in the eighties where there wasn't much going on, bunch of names you never heard of. Then, you know, Mike Tyson shows up, you know, then we get the Klitschko brothers. And now it's like, who, I don't know where we are. You know, there's, there's eras, you know, yeah. like you, you talk about, Detroit Muscle, you know, and you you wax poetic about a 1966 split level uh, split window vet. 
And you go, yeah, that was kind of the pinnacle of Detroit, the 60s, and the kind of stuff they're putting out. Uh, Ford had j- just getting into Le Mans with the GT4, and you go, okay. Then you get to 1974, and you got a Chevy <laughs> Vega. You know what I mean? And a Ford Granada. A Gremlin. And a Gremlin. AMC Gremlin. And a Pacer. Yeah. And you got some of the junkiest cars. You know, a decade after your beloved split window, 10 years later, yeah. you have some of the junkiest, crappiest cars. <laughs> K cars. K cars. <laughs> so the worst vehicles ever, Renault Alliance. Where <laughs> I like the Renault Alliance because AMC, the world's worst American car company, oh. says, what if we partnered up with Renault? the world's worst European car. It's like, what if we took the two ugliest people on the planet and forced them to have a baby? It's like, this sounds like the worst idea ever. And of course, a car is a pile of junk. So there's an ebb and a flow. Yeah. And, and, and you, you, you talk about, uh, you know, you, you talk about Richard Pryor and you talk about Seinfeld and you, you talk about George Carlin and go, oh, those were some salad days. You know, Don yeah. Rickles, oh, those yeah. were some salad days. Then they sort of slide down and you get some of these like 80s comedians. I mean, I know all those guys are around still, but I Me. mean, but take, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't want to say anything say on it, your but show. Yeah, but yeah. But. That skinny tie with the sleeves pulled up on the blazer. <laughs> that was me. That was I, you. I, right. I did the Tonight Show with that exact same look. And, right. First and you, one, you go, yeah. okay, this was not a good year, but music. <laughs> <laughs> architecture has you know yeah you go see a house built in 1973 it's a pile of junk see yeah. one from the 20s it's a museum right right, right. right. so it's like or the 30s and 40s where the had mid-century modern stuff absolutely pretty cool yeah mid, into the into the 60s but you had 50s 60s you had to find that mid-century but yeah the, the point is is there's a kind of a salad days and a kind of hard days and a, and there's a regrouping days you know what did american you know hey corvette's a kick-ass car now but it yeah. took it took some years for them to kind of regroup there were some bad ones they've had some bad ones <clears throat> and so i you know it's, i'd say comedy like architecture like automotive design like any art is really just has its you know and so it got really politically correct and we started listening to a bunch of kooks and people were worried about getting canceled and so it like it took a dip for a while and now yeah. it's on on the men you know now we're you know rebuilding and who knows who the next you know uh don rickles is or where he'll I come don't, from i don't know you know i think about that and i think about you know uh comics being able to say what everybody's thinking and that's the real power of comedy is that over the years it kind of reduces the social strata that exists out there to to the truth and that's why you laugh at it because, you know, everybody's already thinking it. Everybody's already loaded with that thought and no one wants to say it, but the comic will go up and say it. Even Full House got canceled, you know, but the show is cross-generational now. You know, it's, um, we've never been off the air since 1987, which was why I was curious to see if your kids ever watched, watched the show. Well, um, <clears throat> my son's kind of a snob. <laughs> I mean, it was all I could do to get him to watch Fast and Furious with me. He turned his nose up at it. Really? What's he? What, why? What's he into? He likes quality. Really? <laughs> wow! Well, imagine that. No, um, he wants to watch On the Waterfront. And get like out of here! That, yeah, he's really? watching movies from the '40s and stuff. And I'm like, watch, you know, get in some Vin Diesel with me here, boy. <laughs> and he's like, that's junk. I don't want to watch your junk really? movies. And I'm like, listen, Cobra you know stallone's cobra of course it's junk it's the greatest junk ever <laughs> you know what i mean doritos are junk you can't stop eating them you know what I mean? there's a lot of junk out there doesn't oh. mean it's not good oh man um all right adam we get to do one more thing with you before we say goodbye because it's time for aw cut it out cut it out of course every episode of full house had a heartfelt scene and we have cut out a scene from episode three that we're going to read together. So, Adam, you got your script. You're going to be playing the role of Danny Tanner. Okay. Thank you. All right. You ready? Uh, set the table here. Okay. It's it's the heart wrenching, tear jerking scene from episode four. Yeah, I'm I'm off uh, book. You're off book already. Um, Are you? Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I memorized it before a, I came in. That's a, you got the job. You are hired. 
I had my right. assistant read with me all last <laughs> night. I dressed up like Danny. We did a full house living room recreation. Oh, I, I hope this takes place in the living room because it was is, a really expensive oh, man, recreation. That is, that is that is show dedication. I'll, I'll right hold there. it just for balance. All right, but just I, get, I don't do need that. It. Whatever you're I'm comfortable. Off. I'm off. But now, so where are we? We in the kitchen? We are. Uh, do we know where we're at, producer Dylan? Adam's a method actor. We got to let him know exactly, precisely, what's going on here. What the? This isn't the episode where they drove the Mustang through the kitchen, is it? No, and that was a, a that was like an old '88 or something. Oh, it was an old. Because I directed a Fuller House episode where we recreated that. Oh, right. And they had to find that car, same kind of car, and paint it that awful Ranberry. It was like red. Red color. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we had to crash it through the kitchen again. All right. I don't need to know where I he am. He doesn't need to know. Point. This is a guy. Yeah, here's the thing. It's like, I need to know where I am, but you're at in some a chair. point, I think <laughs> I got to pee, <laughs> so I don't need to know where I am. <laughs> You could pee in that chair. Oh, I did. Did you? Yeah. All right. A lot or a little? Like, like. Uh, I flipped the cushion over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. A, shall I start? That'd be a great country tune. You can uh, only flip, flip, the the cu cushion flip the cushion one over. time in life. <laughs> um, now, I'm talking to Stephanie here. Who am I talking Yeah, to? I'm going to be. You're just Danny. I'm all the other characters. All right. All right. So here we go. All right. Ready? Ready and action. We'll be right with you. We're having a little family problem here. We'll look for Bubba for the rest of our lives. That's all right. Bubba's work here was done. I'm sure he's out in the world saving other lives. You mean, we're really not mad at us? No, you didn't think we would get mad over a stinky turtle. Hey, if you had four armpits and you were an inch off the ground, how would you smell? Girls, girls, I know you feel bad, but that's because you love your Uncle Jesse and you feel like you let him down. I know that losing Bubba was an accident. You've got to understand we're right behind you, no matter what you do. And if you ever have a problem, we'll be there for you. That's right. And if you ever have a problem, we know you guys are going to be there for us, right? All right. Come here, you little munchkins. Give us a hug. They hug Jesse and Joey. Next. I, I'm, not, I'm unclear on the next. I, I wasn't. He wants the next hug. I want the next He hug. wants the I, next hug. I probably could have. Always. I could have done better with that That just one. brought a tear to my eye. Thank you, Adam Carolla, ladies and gentlemen. Well, did I get the part uh, or you not? Got the, you got the part, and you can keep the chair. <laughs> Flip that cushion. It was really great having Adam Carolla here for episode four of Full House Rewind. Here's a bit of trivia about Full House episode four. It's the first time that we get to see all three of Jesse, Joey, and Danny's moms together. It's also the first time that we hear a James Brown tune on the show. And it's the first and only time that Bubba the Turtle would make an appearance. Full House videos seem to be everywhere you look on the internet. <laughs> And we like to bring them to you on Full House Rewind. So here, here's one of those. Take a look. Show me a ridiculous photo that you have with a celebrity. I'll go first. This was such a happy day in my life. Uh, look how happy I am with that photo. I mean, I got to judge sandwiches with Uncle Joey. Who would have thought judging sandwiches could create so much love? <laughs> if you got a video you'd like to send us, we'd love to hear from you. Send us the link to your video at fullhouserewind at podco.us. We close every episode of Full House Rewind by giving all of you who need it a hug. So here it is, your Full House hug. Bring it in. There you go. All right. That's our show. We'd like to thank Adam Carolla for stopping by and thank you for listening and watching. You are the heart and soul of Full House Rewind. Now go out there and share the love. So long. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Full House Rewind. To watch clips from the pod, go check out the Full House Rewind Clips YouTube channel at the link in the description. And we'll see you next week.